Nuclear power plants are thermal power stations which generate electrical energy from heat. They consist of numerous buildings and facilities, the most important of which are as follows. The turbine building houses several turbines as well as the generator necessary for electrical power generation. The containment building where the nuclear reactor is housed is made of meter-thick reinforced concrete. Inside this building, nuclear reactions take place where water is heated up. The cooling tower, which can be as tall as 200 meters, is where hot water is cooled. In order to easily understand the underlying principles, the following is a description of the most important components of a nuclear power plant that uses a pressurized water reactor, PWR. In the reactor pressure vessel, the nuclear reaction and the associated release of thermal energy takes place. In a pressurized water reactor, as in this case, the reactor pressure vessel stands about 12 meters tall. The walls are about 25 centimeters thick. Inside is where the fuel assemblies can be found. In pressurized water reactors, about 150 such assemblies are installed. A single fuel assembly is composed of many fuel rods. A fuel rod is about 5 meters in length and has a diameter of about 23 centimeters. The actual nuclear fuel is found inside of each fuel rod. Small nuclear fuel pellets composed of enriched uranium or plutonium make nuclear fission chain reaction possible. In the fission chain reaction, thermal energy is released. Water is needed in order to absorb the thermal energy and keep the chain reaction going. Inside the vessel, the water is heated to over 570 degrees Fahrenheit. The water does not boil, however, since the pressurizer maintains the water pressure constant at around 160 bars. The heated water is eventually pumped to a heat exchanger, also called steam generator. These are typically in the form of a shell and tube heat exchanger. Hot water flows through the U-tubes, heating up the metal of the pipes so that any water inside the heat exchanger begins to boil. The resulting steam is eventually fed through a set of pipes to the turbine building. The steam first drives a high-pressure turbine and then is typically fed to two low-pressure turbines. All of the turbines are connected by a spinning shaft to the electrical generator, which in turn produces AC electricity from the shaft's rotational energy. The steam is converted again into liquid form in a condenser and then returned back to the steam generator. The water needed for this often comes from an adjacent river or is cooled in a cooling tower. The water circulation systems are always kept separate from one another. Water in the primary circulation system never leaves the containment building. This water is radioactive since it has been in direct contact with the fuel rods. Water in the secondary circulation system is used to drive the turbines and is not radioactive. The cooling circulation system provides cool water and is used to condense the steam in the secondary circulation system. So welcome to E.8.3 and 4. We're combining those into this video. We're going to describe the characteristic sources, storage, and disposal methods for different types of radioactive waste. Um, we have hundreds of um, nuclear power plants around the world. We have taken a look at how we use radioisotopes in medicine. So we need to be able to dispose of these in some way. And 
you know, we want to make sure that in the process, we're trying to preserve the environment and protect the health of, of organisms and people. We divide these into three different types, low level radiation or radioactive waste, medium level and high level. We're going to start off with the low level and low level has two major um, components of its definition. So when you are writing this, you're going to have to say that it has a low activity and a short half-life. So let's focus on activity. Activity means that it basically has a low concentration of radioisotopes. In other words, there aren't a lot of radioisotopes in the sample. Most of the ones that are in there are actually stable. And the ones that aren't, so the few radioactive ones, will emit alpha particles and low energy beta particles. Now, what does that mean? In nuclear reactions, we're basically always looking at three different types of radiation. Alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma radiation. Alpha particles are helium nuclei, so two protons and two neutrons with no electrons, so they're positively charged. And since they're relatively large because they're made of nucleons, they really don't pass through, very, through much material, so a piece of paper can stop them. A beta particle is an electron. It has a very low mass as a result, but it's also negatively charged as opposed to the alpha's positive charge. And because it's smaller, it can pass through things like paper, um, but it will be absorbed by things like plastic or your hand. And alpha particles would also be absorbed by your hand. And that's not good. All of this type of radiation um, is not good for your cells. And the last one is the most damaging because it's the highest energy. This is gamma radiation. And the important thing to note about gamma radiation is that it is not a particle. It is energy. It is light that, in other words, it's a photon. So it's similar to ultraviolet visible light infrared, like we were talking about in the greenhouse effect. But the difference is that gamma radiation is the, on the highest energy, on the, it's, it's um, on the, the side of the electromagnetic spectrum that has the highest energy. And so if they have a lot of energy, then they can um, do a lot of damage as they interact with materials. So you can see that this can pass through your hand, through paper, it can also pass through steel, and some of it can even pass through thick lead. So it's very hard to stop this type of gamma radiation. So you want to make sure that you have a good uh, basic understanding of the three different types there. So that's what low level emits. Basically we'll find that through radiotherapy. So looking at the um, iodine radioisotopes and the cobalt 60 um, used for radiotherapy. Those are low level sources. Food irradiators. Those are basically used to make sure that food is being preserved for longer. So it's sort of like destroying the bacteria. And smoke detectors have inside them like americium. Now to dispose of these types of things, if it has a half-life of a few hours, what you want to use is a steel container for a few days, and then after those few days, it will have all um, decayed radioactively into something that is not harmful, and so it can be disposed as normal waste. If it takes a few days, um, then you can store it, then sometimes they store it underwater or in a pond until more of it has um, turned into something less harmful and then they'll dispose of it. Now in terms of hours and days and half-lives, what does that really mean? Well, what the, here we're going to illustrate this. Here we have carbon-14 and this is a radioisotope that decays um, every 5,700 years, so that's denoted here, into um, nitrogen-14. So right here we can see we're starting off with all carbon-14s and so we have 100% of carbon-14. I press play here and what we can see is that now they are starting to decay into nitrogen. After the first half-life of 5,700 years I have 50 percent left of what I started with. In other words I have half of what I started with. That's why we call it a half-life. A half-life is the time it takes for half of the amount that you start with to decay. Now that I have 50%, the next half-life, the second half-life, is going to not take away another 50%, because then I, that would be taking away 100% of 50. 
I'm going to be taking away 50% of 50, in other words, 25% of my original amount. So we'll see here, 50% over the next half-life is going to be um, decaying a little bit more slowly to 25%. So you want to note that over the first half-life we lost 50% and over the second half-life we only lost 25%. Then over the third half-life it's going to be half of the 25%. So half of the 25 ends up being 12 and a half. So it keeps repeating that cycle. So the half-life is the amount for half of it to decay. So that can, if that takes hours or days then it's a low level um, radiation. Now our next one is medium level. And the activity in terms of this is that it's medium. They're going to emit alpha particles as well and medium energy beta particles, again the electrons. The half-life is going to be medium, so upwards of a few years. And you'll find that basically parts from nuclear reactors, like what you saw in the video there, some of the parts that were um, in contact with the fuel rods, those types of things are what we call medium level radiation. In order to get rid of those, um, what we do is what we call an ion exchange and absor adsorption. And actually this is fairly similar to flocculation that was looked at in waste treatment for water. Uh, basically the radioactive material will adsorb to the surface of uh, some sort of substance that will then sink out and then they can remove that radioactive material that it has um, sunk to the bottom. They'll then store it in a shielded container. When we say shielded, we generally mean that there's something thick and dense around it, so like a piece of lead. And then it will be mixed with concrete and a shallow burial. So when we talk about burying um, in a shallow way, it's something like this. A few different layers, but it's, you know, it's not far underground. Um, and that's what we end up with. The last one is the one that we are most concerned about is the high level radiation and the activity here is high which means there's just there's a lot of radioactive isotopes in these samples and they emit high energy beta particles and the very damaging gamma rays. Their half-life is very long it can be from hundreds to millions of years so this is a type of radiation that is going to be around it's going to be radioactive um, for thousands and thousands of years. So it's something that we create now that will influence and have to be taken care of for a very, very long time. Now, this comes from our nuclear fission products in our power plants, like you saw in the video there. Nuclear weapons also produce this, as well as radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Now, say that three times. Um, those are actually really cool. There are some areas where it's either very remote or for example in space, um, like satellites or like the rovers, where they try to use radioisotopes as a way to make electricity. So if you dispose of that, um, there, that's another source of that. Sometimes they use them, or they used to use them, uh, sometimes in lighthouses. Now this high level radiation, we have to be very careful about how to store and dispose of it. So the first thing that we generally do, I'm going to sort of group one and two together because um, you'll see in a second. Vitrification um, is a process whereby basically you turn the radioactive waste into glass, a type of glass, not like a glass that you drink with, but it's, it has properties similar to glass. And it's still radioactive, very radioactive, but it, it's been transformed into a different form. Um, and then number two, another option instead of classification is an ion exchange and absorption again, just separating it out. And um, once you've done that, either in, in both of these cases, vitrification or ion exchange, your next step is to bury it deep underground. And I'm highlighting deep and shallow because it's been pointed out in previous exams that students lose marks for not specifying whether it's shallow or deep. So medium level is shallow, high level is deep, and you can't forget to use that word or else you lose a mark. So when we talk about deep, well, what do we mean by deep? How deep? Um, in this case here, um, here's some products, um, some fission products from the nuclear reactor. Um, in other words, they turn that into vitrified waste. 
there's an option here to store it for 30 to 50 years in a temporary storage facility. But then when you get to the final deep burial, um, it goes more than 300 meters deep. And, and so that's quite, quite deep. And the reason that that happens is so that when those gamma rays are going out, you know, they won't make it to the surface and, and hurt um, any life on the surface. Um, they'll probably be absorbed by something along the way. So that's why we do that. Now a third option for dealing with this high level radiation is what we call transmutation, which is where we specifically put these waste through another process um, where they decay further um, radioactively into safer isotopes that can then be disposed of um, you know, in a, maybe in a different way or they won't be as radioactive as long. So that's another option. Now, there's always a few questions where they try to ask about, you know, um, sort of discussing the effectiveness. And what we want you to realize is that high level radiation, so down here, there are two things you don't want to do. You don't want to put it in landfills because the radioactive waste would leak into the water table and it's very high energy, so then it can definitely um, affect people and life around it. Uh, and we don't want to incinerate it because then you're basically just sending it up into the atmosphere because incineration is um, combustion. So if you try to put it in there, you're just spreading it around because really the radioactive waste isn't going to combust because it's not carbon based. And uh, so basically it's just going to be spread out and around. Some potential problems of the burials here, the deep underground burials, um, we have to realize that these things will be radioactive for thousands of years. And so when we try to sort of contemplate building something that's going to store something that's harmful for thousands of years, that's very difficult because really um, the oldest thing that we've built that's lasted a long time is like the, the pyramids and that's only a few thousand years. So what about something that needs to last, you know, tens of thousands of years? So we have to start considering things like geological instability, you know, earthquakes and natural tectonic movements and those types of things, but also the fact that things just naturally degrade through chemical processes. So if you build this underground facility, how could it possibly last that long? So when something happens like an earthquake or it you know, breaks down, then there could be some leaking. And number two, this stuff, if we just bury it and we don't try and go through a transmutation process, then we're making, we're essentially ensuring that it's going to be there for a long time. And then the third um, sort of potential problem is that um, this can be a potential weapon for terrorists. This is radioactive material that can harm people. So that basically covers what you need to know about radioactive waste.